someone, someone said, you're preaching today? I said, yeah. And I said, well, you won't know what the passage is. She said, no, it's the I one. And that's the one we're doing today, the I passage. <laughs> and I thought, that's an interesting way to mem- remember this passage where you pluck out your eye if it offends you. So you can call this message the I message if you want. That wasn't really my preference or my title, but it it would do. Anything to help you to remember, I think that would be helpful. Um, but, uh, But this is a passage that really is, there are a lot of passages that are, um, I don't know, I don't know what you want to call them, in some ways disturbing, in some ways uh, troubling, icky. I don't, I don't know, you can, you can put your own word in there. There are some passages, especially in the Old Testament, you go to the book of Judges, there are some bizarre things that take place. But rarely do you see, of course, probably the most amazing thing that's in scripture is the crucifixion that's just so troubling and we need to see it as that and we need to see the value of that but also as we look at passage jesus didn't do or or say a lot of things that really just all of a sudden caused you to go wait a minute what what in the world are you saying here there were plenty of things he caused me to stop and wonder but this one it's like you come to a dead stop and you say what in the world am I supposed to do with this? So we're going to look at this today. So I need a break here. I lost an hour's sleep, so. Okay. So we're going to look at Mark chapter 9. We're continuing with our series. And the title of this message is Discipleship on a New Level. I, I really think that Jesus was bringing the disciples to a new level of understanding. And if he's doing that for the disciples, we should pay attention to it too. So we're going to look at this. Um, in this passage, I'm going to say this really quick. In some versions of the Bible, there's verses 44 and 46. In the ESV, they leave verses 44 and 46 out because it wasn't in there in the older texts. And they were the same as verse 48. So 48 is the same as verse 44 and 46. However, I think scribes later on wanted to really give an emphasis on, on 48 because it's, it's, a, it's a gross verse too. So you wanna, they wanted to make a point. So I think that was the reason for it, but we will not be reading verses 44 and 46, but we will read verse 48, okay? There, now we will read the scripture and then we'll pray. Starting at verse 42, it says, whoever causes one of these little ones, Jesus is saying this, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of heaven with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good. But if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. Let's pray. So, Father, we come to you this morning desirous to gain understanding, to be envisioned, to have our lives affected in many different ways. Lord, we need your understanding of this passage. Lord, many people have misunderstood it. Many people have have stayed away from it. Lord, you said it to us for a reason. So we pray, Lord, for your help, your guidance, 
and your understanding by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So this passage kind of brings up some uncomfortable things. And um, as I said, Jesus said it, so we need to look at it. Um, and we need this passage to help mold us as believers. It's, it's an important passage, and a lot of times it is overlooked. My main point this morning is Jesus points us to the repulsion of sin and hell, the magnitude of God's love, and opens us to the heart of the gospel. So Jesus points us to the repulsion of sin and hell, the magnitude of God's love, and opens us to the heart of the gospel. So we're going to look at three different points here. And I'm just going to read these points real quick. God cares for his children so much that, that's the first point, God hates sin so much that, and God loves so much that. Makes it easier when you don't have to finish sentences. So that's why they're that way. God cares for his children so much that. We'll look at that first. Verse 42, it says, Whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. It's a simple lesson. It's a troubling lesson. It's a troubling verse. Some of you may be thinking, um, do you want to be talking about this if there are kids in the room and, you know, things along that line? But we have to remember that Jesus had children there listening. He used one as an illustration earlier in the passage in that chapter. So people need to hear this. This is something we need to hear. It's something our kids need to hear. A lot of times, I wasn't going to say this, but I will anyway. A lot of times when we... Uh, are raising our children, we, we want to protect them. And I, I think it's good, I think we should protect them, protect them from the world, but a lot of times we protect them from the spiritual things because we don't feel they're ready yet. And really, there are spiritual foundations we need to be building into our kids early on. So sometimes we have to explain things to them, which I'll let you do at home when you take them home, but um, there's, there's that aspect of our children that they need to see these things as well. So Jesus is showing a protective and authoritative side of himself here. That is what he's showing. He's a big brother. He's a friend. This is what he's showing. God cares for his children so much that he warns people. He's warning the disciples, not just some goof on the street. He's warning the disciples of this. We are his disciples as well. We need to pay attention to this as well. And that is, don't mess with the young ones who believe. Don't cause problems for the young ones who believe. Young in age or young in spirit, it can go either way. Don't cause them to sin. He wants them protected. That's what Jesus is saying. He wants them to flourish. He wants them to grow. That's what we would like. So he says, whoever causes, the word causes there in the Greek, it means, it means to put a stumbling block or impediment in the way upon which a person would trip or fall or entice to, to sin. It's kind of like sticking your foot out when somebody's walking by and you cause them to trip like people used to do to me in school. It also means to cause a person to begin to distrust or to desert one whom he ought to trust and obey. It causes the person to fall away. And Jesus said, it is better for him. Jesus is, isn't saying this is the punishment. Jesus is saying this is the better thing that could happen to him. The better thing that could happen to one of those people is if a rope was tied around their neck with a millstone on the end of it, and they were thrown into the sea. That's the better side. It would be better for him to have that. You would drown, you would die. That's better than what God would do to you if you cause one of these to stumble. See, there's something to see here about Jesus. He cares for his people. He's deeply involved with his people. He's involved with his people then. He is involved with his people now, and it's important for us to see this. And he wants us to spiritually succeed. And uh, he's got these warnings. And there's warnings all through the word of God. Don't mess with God's people. Or punishment will happen. 
When we sing the, the song, He Is, I think we sang it last week, the Crowder song, He Is, it describes the different things that Jesus is. It says, comforter, counselor, prince of peace, author, and maker of everything, defender, deliverer, king of kings, helper, healer forevermore, savior, and shelter through every storm, my refuge, redeemer, Lord of lords, and child of heaven, son of man, provider, protector, protector the great I am, the alpha, the omega, the beginning and end. He is. You mess with God's young ones, you're in trouble. God cares for his children so much. You're one of his children. He cares for you so much. But see, I think there's another aspect to this that we need to look at. And yes, we do want to realize God cares for his children. God cares for us. I think every one of us would agree that God cares for us. We need to realize that, that he cares for us. But there's another aspect, and I have a question for you. How do you see God's people? How do you see God's people? How do you see the Christian sitting next to you? the Christian family member, the sibling, are they as cherished to you as Jesus cherishes them? What do you think of them? Do you have a protective heart for your fellow believer, for your children, for, for your siblings, for your coworkers that are believers, whether you like them or not? Do you, do you have this sense that you need to also Look out for them and protect them. How serious are we in making sure that we do not lead others astray? How careful are we at doing that as well? Seeing people, and this is my point, seeing people as Christ's possession should cause us to value them, should cause us to have a different opinion about them and to care for them all the more. When we first had Children, we didn't really want them, but when we first got them, all of a sudden it changed. Megan was born. Oh my goodness. Of course, we almost forgot her the first time we went out after we were born because we weren't used to having children. But the first time we got a babysitter, it was a teenager. Her name was Carla. Um, she was 16 years old. And... We were, you know, when you have this precious little child all of a sudden in your hands and your responsibility and you're scared to hand this person over to somebody else, you're thinking, what am I going to do? You know, Carla, God bless her, she's Christian, married, has a couple of kids, grandchildren now. Uh, she assured us how she would care for that little kid and make sure that she was all taken care of. She thought this was the greatest thing to take care of our little daughter. And Megan is still alive today because of that. But she had that sense that this is an important possession of someone. We need to look at God's people as important possessions. We can't just start saying, well, we kind of don't like that one. You know, when Bauer was talking about how the disciples are coming to Jesus saying, these guys are casting out demons in your name. And Jesus is saying, don't, don't, don't panic. Don't worry about it. Something good's happening here. They're taking care of some things. You need to take care of some things. Don't put them down because they're not one of the 12. God's doing a great work, a bigger work, a greater work than we could ever imagine. And we need to love like Jesus. That's what we need to do. We need to care for people like Jesus. So I think there's something in that as well. God cares for us so much that he, um, well, God cares for his people so much that we need to change our view of who people are. Now, the next verse, or the next point, God hates sin so much we need to look at that. We need to love people so much or care for people so much, but we need to hate sin so much as God has hated sin as well. Verses 43 through 47 
It says, and if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If it is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go into hell to unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Jesus is bringing a radical thought and a radical action here. This is, this is really, no pun intended, this is an eye-opening statement. It's, it's really a, a very strange thing. And when you think about it, if our sin offends us, if we are sinning with different appendages on our body and we start cutting them off, we'll all just be rolling around on the floor. There'll be nothing left here. So I think we need to look at this a little more carefully. It's a radical aspect of discipleship uh, that we really haven't seen before. And we need to look at this. So Jesus talks about hell. Did you know that Jesus talks about hell more than anywhere else in the Bible. Jesus talks about hell. And we need to look at that. Uh, hell is a healthy motivation for salvation. I'll give you that. It's a reality. Hell does exist. Scripture calls it a place of torment, eternal destruction, a lake of fire, torment of fire, smoke of torment. It goes on forever and ever. And there's more things that I could list here. But you know, there was a survey done in this country and it says, said that uh, this is what they found. They said, uh, most Americans, most Americans believe in a heaven of some sort. So most Americans believe that there's a heaven of some sort. When asked whether they would go there when they die, most Americans believe that they would go there when they die. When they asked if they believed in a hell, most Americans said, no, we don't believe in a hell. There's no such thing, no such place, never will be. That just doesn't exist. And then they, when uh, they looked at churches, most churches don't like talking about hell. They don't like talking about it. If we come right down to it, most Christians are even sort of apologetic for the concept of hell. They don't, want to, they don't want to cause people to feel uncomfortable. And when they're talking to people about the gospel, they more consider, want them to, to believe in Jesus without any understanding of a punishment. Mainly because we don't understand it. We want to be nice. We don't want to be judged. We, we don't want to scare people away because we're talking about hell. But how is that caring for people? If we're supposed to care for people as Jesus cared for people, how are we caring for people by not telling them about hell? It's real. There's a punishment that's there. We don't need to cover for God. We don't think, oh, God's a little harsh. Maybe we should tone him down a little bit. We don't need to be doing that. He didn't make any mistakes. Truth is truth. So let's look at hell for a minute. Hell defined here, um, the term is Gehenna, the Greek term. There are other terms that are used. And Gehenna is the place of future punishment. Uh, this was originally the Valley of Hinnom. The Valley of Hinnom was a little south of Jerusalem. And before the Jewish people lived in Jerusalem, this was a place where idol worship was done and there were human sacrifices that were taking place. Babies were sacrificed in these places. It was a horrendous place and, uh, and just a horrible place when you think about it. And when Jerusalem uh, was then taken over by the Jews and the temple was built and, and the city was developed and south of Jerusalem there, that valley there became the place where they would throw all the dead animals from sacrifices. They would throw the trash and the filth from the city. It became the dump. Basically, it became the dump. Therefore, it became a, a symbol of the wicked 
and their future destruction. Um, it was a dump there where everything was burned. The fires never really went out because if you didn't keep up with it, there would be pests, there would be diseases, there would be um, all kinds of health risks. And this is the illustration that Jesus is trying to, to bring forth that this is what hell is like. It's a horrible place. So God hates sin so much. Sin is such an opposite of God. Sin has to be punished. Sin is wrong. Sin is not what, this is, what God's building his kingdom on. It's to purify the kingdom. So there had to be a price that was paid. Sin is so harmful, it is offensive, that Jesus gives some perspective as to what we need to look at. Okay? Now, he says, it would be better for you to cut your hand off. Where did we hear that before? It would be better for you to have a rope tied around your neck with a millstone. It's the same type of illustration. Jesus is giving us an illustration. He's not being literal here. He's not trying to get us to cut our hands off. He's not trying to get us to cut our feet off and leave your eyes where they are, okay? Um, but it's better than suffering in hell. So he's not being literal. We can't blame our appendages for, for sin. Uh, it is our condition. It is our heart's motivation. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, Scripture says. We're all sinners. We need a salvation. So that's first of all. Secondly, we don't, we, and we want to understand this first, we don't enter into the kingdom of God maimed. Like if, 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 you, you got the idea that we'd enter into heaven without a hand if we cut our hand off because we sinned and that was the payment for our sin. No, Bible says we get, are given new bodies where, where everything is perfect. Uh, all sorrow is gone. There's not a bunch of people walking around with one eye to remind them of their sin in the past. That's not what heaven's about. That's not what Jesus is trying to say, okay? So what he is saying is, and this is what I think he's trying to say anyway, you know, um, that you guys need to understand. Jesus is saying you've got to understand that this whole aspect of the horrendous part of sin that is played in our lives is an ongoing battle that we need to deal with. Jesus is stepping up. Now, I, I think... Jesus is stepping up his prep for his disciples. He has been, since, since earlier on, he has been starting to ramp up his, his uh, preparation, his discipleship, his, he's preparing them for the things to come because there's a lot of heavy stuff coming down here. And he's trying to get that information for, for them so that they are prepared. Jesus hates sin so much that he is providing information that will help them to overcome sin. That's what's going on here. Now, as I share this, I'm going to share something with you. As I share this, I'm not trying to negate the work of Jesus, his death, his burial, his resurrection, the work of the Holy Spirit to sanctify, nor am I belittling the penalty of sin. Sin is a grievous thing where God and sin cannot coexist. But Jesus provided the way for us to be forgiven of our sin. But the battle is ongoing for sin. There's an ongoing battle that we have to continue to continue on. So I believe that Jesus is giving us some common sense ways of dealing with and avoiding sin when we're tempted. Temptation isn't sin. It's acting upon temptation that's sin, okay? So I, I told this story 10 years ago so I don't think most of you heard it, but uh, this is the best way I could, uh, could uh, really make the point. Because we're talking about hands, feet, eyes, all right? What's, what's Jesus trying to say in here? And this is the only thing I could come up with that wasn't gruesome and awful. And we could apply this actually to any sin that you commit. So this is kind of helpful. So when I was a little kid and... I used to go to Zayers. How many remember Zayers? 
Oh, yes, we got a number of people. And the sporting section, you know, I always loved going to the sporting section. The sporting section had guns. They sold guns at Zares. They had knives. I loved looking at the knives. Of course, I was like, you know, in fifth grade, but I'd always go and look at the knives. One day when I'm there, there's a whole bucket full of golf tees and a cup in it, and it says, golf tees, a quarter a cup. So for 25 cents, I could buy some golf tees. I did not play golf, okay? But I saw this, and I looked at it, and I walked over to it. I saw it, I walked over to it, I looked around, nobody is around, and all of a sudden I reached my hand in and stuck a whole handful of golf tees in my pocket. I'm a thief, I'm a felon, I don't know what I am. Like I said, there are more graphic illustrations, but hopefully you get the point that stealing here is a sin. It's a sin, a sin is a sin, and in God's eyes a sin is a sin. And if we look at it, I saw something that I wanted that wasn't mine. I walked over to take something that wasn't mine. I used my hand to take what wasn't mine. But you know, God sees. God sees sin. See, Jesus is trying to get his disciples to see much more. You have to be able to deal with your sin. I'm not gonna be here to say, no, don't do that. You have to be able to do that. So, in discipleship, you know, Jesus, when we think of discipleship and when we think of what Jesus is doing with the disciples, we start to look at it and we say, uh, you know, they're followers of Jesus. I don't know if you've ever seen a bunch of like, like, first graders or, you know, even the kids downstairs, if the teachers bring in someone, they're all kind of following around in this little group. And, and that's about it. You know, everybody's keeping them safe. You're a bunch of little ducklings following the mother duck. They're all following them around. Those aren't disciples, okay? Those are little infants just following things around. Disciples are those that not just follow who the leader is, but their life is changed because of what the leader is saying what the leader is telling, where the leader is leading. And this is something for us to realize. It helps us to understand ourselves and others. That's what discipleship does. It keeps us from stumbling over ourselves and over others. It helps us to learn the process of temptation, the eye, the hand, and the foot, and what to do with that. And it helps to motivate us so that we're dealing with our sin and we're not just having these desires or pride or lust or anger or self-exaltation so that we can get what we want. A disciple is ever-changing to become more like Jesus. If Jesus says something is sin, it's something that we need to look at. And we need to live our life in light of eternity. Therefore, we want to cut off those opportunities and deal with those things that we are faced with through our lives. You know, if it wasn't for Jesus, we'd all be going to hell. And we want to look at, because of what he did for us, we want to be able to live our lives dealing with sin as sin so that we can conquer sin, overcome sin by the power that Jesus provides. Now, for those that don't know the Lord, that's a whole other issue. This is where the caring comes back in. Do we care about people? We need to tell them about Jesus. We need to tell them that there is a judgment. They need to be told, the family and the friends and the co-workers, about verse 48, where their worm does not die and their fire is not quenched. That passage is taken out of Isaiah 66, when Isaiah is talking about the new kingdom that's coming. And he's describing the final judgment in the new heaven and the new earth. He uses that verse because there is punishment. There are two ways to look at this. The final judgment, when those who sin and are not forgiven, there is punishment. The worm, the word worm there is the kind that feeds on the dead and it just continues to feed and just 
keeps on feeding. The fire is not quenched, it's that horrible thought. And it should be a horrible thought. Um, you know, people joke about hell, they use the term hell very loosely. And it's really, it's, it's, it's too bad because they're not understanding. You know, if they say they have a hell of a good time, I just, I just don't get that. That is not what it is. Hell is real. And we need to understand that. It's an act of denial on a lot of people's parts. And they need to realize that there is truly punishment that's going to happen. But there's another way that we can look at this. Let's look at it from today's standpoint. When sin is committed and unrepented of, um, when we haven't asked for forgiveness, we haven't really repented of the sin, okay, Let's look at the worm as guilt. And the worm is just eating. It's just eating at you. I think I, I've experienced that. It just starts to eat at you. It's ever gnawing at your conscience, your thoughts. It's a torment, if you will. And the fire is the appetite for sin, that desire that calls for more, more wood on that fire. to not cut out this sin, you're going to commit it again and again. That's basically what happens. The guilt will build again and again. But in Christ, the payment has been paid. Forgiveness has been given. It's available to us. Deliverance is possible. First, first John 1 John 1.9, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What a gift we have been given. Deliverance is possible for us in Jesus Christ. Isn't the Lord good to help us? To understand, help us understand the severe ramifications of sin, but God hates sin so much that he gave his only begotten son. That we won't suffer the consequences. Let's look at the last point. God loves so much, so he cares so much, he hates sin so much, but he loves so much. Verses 40, 49 and 50. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. Salt. Salt. Biblically, salt is a symbol of covenant. It's a symbol of friendship. It's a symbol of loyalty. When there were special meals and different tribes got together and they were, they were being friendly and making covenants with one another so they'd all get along well, salt was always there. Salt was a big thing. And when we look at these passages, we have to look at it in light of biblical times. Salt was very important. If also, it was used in sacrifices, Leviticus 2.13. If you shall season all your grain offerings with salt, you shall not let the salt of the covenant with your God be missing from your grain offering. With all your offerings, you shall offer salt. Salt was a very important thing, and it's symbolic of things. Jesus uses that because they understood that. A lot of times we don't. We don't understand these things. Second Chronicles, it also talks about when the kingship of Israel was given to David forever and his sons, it says, by a covenant of salt. Colossians 4, 6, let your speech also be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how and how you ought to answer each person. Today we see salt as something we put on food, melt snow, salt does that. Something the doctor tells us we should eat less of. But scripture gives us so much more meaning. It's covenant, friendship, relationship, loyalty, kindness. But in those sacrifices, it's a dedicated, it's dedicated to live for God, living for Jesus, a testimony of his grace and forgiveness, his mercy and his love, and being a living sacrifice. Because we are a living sacrifice and we are supposed to do it with a flavor of salt in our lives. 
And we're supposed to be at peace with one another, Jesus says. Be at peace with one another. All of this is to bring peace back in. Because remember earlier when Bauer was preaching, he was talking about who was the greatest in the kingdom of God, and they were starting to argue back and forth over this. Jesus is coming back. That's coming back to his mind. Be at peace with one another. Since the transfiguration, since we did that passage on, they're discovering new things, and Jesus has ramped up the discipleship. There's the glimpses of the kingdom of heaven. Prayer is important in the work. Remember in, in dealing with the demon that couldn't be delivered. Prayer is important for the work. You've got to remember that. If you want to be great in the kingdom of God, you've got to be a servant. Don't be exclusive of others who are following, trying to follow Jesus. Don't, don't come down on them. When temptation comes, cut off the opportunity. Don't flirt with sin and be the living sacrifice that God called you to be. And then be at peace with one another. You know, God loves you so much that he died for you. He wants you as his child. He wants you as his friend. He wants you to be with him forever. And he wants you to live your life on this earth with him and to tell others about that as well. So I have a couple of questions in closing. Here's, here's an obvious one. Where are you going when you die? Where are you going when you die? You're going to be with the Lord? Are you confident of that? Because you can be confident of that. John 5.13, I write the, first John 5.13, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you who believe, who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. John 3, 16 through 18. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes, whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only son of God. See how important it is for that faith, that belief in God. I encourage you, if you do not know Jesus it is time for you to look at your life. Now the question, what area of sin do you need to cut off in your life? Look at your life. Evaluate your life. What area of sin has been a hindrance to you? Watch where you look. Watch where you walk. Watch what you reach out for. Don't flirt with sin. And then pray. Pray for God to intervene. Pray for God to help you. We don't use God as a resource that we, that we could. We, we are very much a people that love to do things in our own strength. We don't want to ask for help. My wife is always telling me, why don't you get help to do that? You're not as young as you used to be. Do not climb up on the roof anymore, which I found out I can't do anyway anymore. Get help. God is available to intervene to change us, to deliver us, because we're his disciples. Then the last question, are there any ways you have led others to sin? If that's the case, humble yourself and go to them. Care for them. See that God cares for them and love them and protect them as Jesus would do. Consider the relationship you have with God spiritually, legally, and be the living sacrifice he's called you to be, seasoned with salt and grace and peace with one another. Let's pray. So, Father, we thank you. Thank you for words that are hard to fully grasp. Lord, we need your help. We need your help to understand much more fully that we might live our lives for your glory that we might fully uh, enjoy the grace, the forgiveness, the restoration, 
the freedom from sin, the, the ability in Jesus and by the power of his spirit to overcome sin. Lord, we pray that you would help us. And we thank you, Lord, for your word. In Jesus' name, amen.